This is a Stories to be Told podcast. Hi everyone and welcome. I'm Tracy D.W., founder and creator of Stories to be Told, an online educational hub and multimedia learning platform aimed at 9 to 14 years, but it's for all learners interested in understanding more about the history of the British Empire, otherwise known as Britain's colonial past. To all our new listeners, welcome and make yourself at home. And if you're a regular listener, welcome back and thank you so much for your continued support for this podcast series and my work. Now, my podcasts do not aim to be the ultimate or only authority on the subject or topic under discussion, but I'd like to share what I've learned and I hope it will provide enough information to stimulate your curiosity into finding out more by beginning your own learning journey about the subject and decide for yourself if history is a matter of fact or perspective. This podcast complements a future publication of the story or poetic narrative Hope for Zimbabwe, Arise the Phoenix. However, There are four other current publications available on this website. Um, Caribbean Wind, Caribbean Rush, Knights at the Round Table, the Berlin Conference 1884, and Gone with the Wind, Macmillan's Speech for Change. Now, the latter two poetic narratives actually do relate to this particular podcast. So if you're interested in finding out more about the topic that I'm going to be discussing in this particular episode. Those two titles are a very good place to start, okay? I was inspired to write Hope for Zimbabwe, Arise the Phoenix, by the recent and past events of the last 40 years that have affected Zimbabwe, and I pray that the country finds a way to recapture its former glory and achieve a unity that can build a better future for all its people. There is a common narrative which runs through all my podcast episodes and that is firstly that Africans were not passive in their struggle for maintaining their identities and regaining liberation and secondly that Africa is not one homogenous identity, but diverse groups of tribes, customs, values, lineages and socio-political structures. The tensions and conflicts created as a result of bringing people together who are not compatible is the tragedy and legacy of colonialism. It is therefore natural that the process of decolonization would perpetuate further tension and conflict between people who have different ideologies regarding freedom and liberation and ways of how to go about achieving this. Zimbabwe is a prime example of how this phenomenon played out against the backdrop of the rise of nationalism across the African continent. In this podcast episode, I'm going to try and explore this by comparing the two political bodies of the indigenous population, ZANU and ZAPU, as they sought to achieve liberation by any means necessary. I want to look at some similarities and contrasts between these two parties. What made each party different in their origins, representation, patronage, approach and strategies? and their common goal in helping their people move towards freedom and eventual independence. So let's get into some core knowledge. Zimbabwe is a landlocked country located in southern Africa. It shares its borders with Mozambique, Zambia, Botswana and South Africa. It was colonised by the British through the exploits of Cecil John Rhodes, who established the British South African Co. to monopolise the use and ownership of the land due to the discovery of diamonds. This was one of the causes which led to the Scramble for Africa and the Berlin Conference in 1884. As the country was renamed Rhodesia in 
and its capital city renamed Salisbury, British troops drove out and deposed King Mizilikazi as well as subjugating tribes such as the Shona and the Dibli, whose response to this was the First Liberation War or First Chemurenga from 1896 to 97. It's important to note that during the 1880s Britain was also in a dispute with Portugal over the right to ownership of Zimbabwe as well as the land now known as Milawe and Zambia. Have a listen to my podcast episode called The Pink Map Project, The Ultimate Paradox, for more about this dispute. British occupation intensified as more and more war veterans from World Wars I and II claimed the land as compensation for their war efforts and developed systems of farming. A structure of segregation mirroring apartheid in South Africa was imposed between British and native Zimbabweans. The rise of nationalism grew in the 1950s and Ghana's independence in 1957 was a watershed moment. But like South Africa, Rhodesia made the grave mistake of overlooking British PM Harold Macmillan's prophetic wind of change speech during Macmillan's tour of Africa in 1960. You can listen to both my standard and expanded podcast episodes to learn more about this particular speech and why it was so important for that time. Rhodesia also went through a period of defiance toward Britain and the West when contradictions and disagreements between British and Rhodesian administrations resulted in Rhodesian PM Ian Smith's unilateral declaration of independence in 1965. This declaration saw consolidation of control over all public services and other forms of governing, resulting in further farmland and housing redistribution which further displaced the native African population, sustaining a white minority rule right the way across Rhodesia. In protest, Two parties emerged from the native African people. The Zimbabwe African National Union, or ZANU, and the Zimbabwe African People's Union, ZAPU, whose combined guerrilla tactics placed pressure on the Rhodesian security forces. This conflict is what we now refer as the Second Chemurenga, or Zimbabwe War of Liberation, from 1964 to 79. The war came to an end as a result of pressure from the US and South Africa for Rhodesia to concede to Britain in the Lancaster House Agreement in London 1979, presided over by British PM Margaret Thatcher. This soon was followed by a democratic election in 1980, with victory for the ZANU party and its leader Robert Mugabe was sworn in as Prime Minister. And Rhodesia was formally renamed Zimbabwe, and its capital city, Harare, and the 18th of April marks the annual day of its celebration of independence. Okay, so that's a bit of core knowledge. Um... Let's move on and explore um, the contrasts and similarities of the politics of the two major parties of the indigenous African people, ZANU and ZAPU, and just do a little study in their differing ideologies and approaches in achieving liberation. Like South Africa, Native Africans in Rhodesia had formed their own national congress, but due to the arrest of many of its leaders and its eventual disbandment, another way of political mobilisation was sought. The National Democratic Party was founded by Joshua Nkomo in 1960 with other associates such as Robert Mugabe and Herbert Chitipo representing the interests of both Shona and the Dibli tribes. However, there was also Rhodesian opposition to the NDP, causing further arrests. After the disbandment of the NDP, ZAPU, 
Zimbabwe African People's Union was formed by Nkomo in 1962. However, internal disagreements about the direction and leadership of ZAPU led to a split, resulting in Mugabe breaking away to form ZANU, the Zimbabwe National Union, and also form the Zimbabwe African National Liberation Army, or ZANLA, as its military arm. In response, ZAPU formed its own military arm in the form of the Zimbabwe People's Revolution Army, or ZIPRA. The first phase of the war played out between 1964 and 71, where both parties deployed differing guerrilla tactics. However, the second phase from 1971 saw both factions uniting to form the Joint Guerrilla Alliance in attempting to overthrow the government. Despite victory, the actions and events surrounding both political factions exemplifies how deeply divided nationalists were. This was not only influenced by differing approaches to achieving liberation and the differing values of the tribes, but also a desire from some native Africans to see the status quo of the current government remain. Many factors influenced people's perceptions of justice and equality, and if the current system was a benefit to some native Africans, then they saw no need to change it. So what of the contrast and similarities between the two parties? ZAPU was formed and led by Joshua and Como of the Nadibli tribe, based around the Dibli ethnicity and was supported by the Soviet Union and East Germany. Their tactics were indirect in nature and approach, preferring negotiation rather than force with storming the heavens planned strategy through airstrikes. They planned to take victory after relying on Zanla to do the heavy lifting. ZANU, on the other hand, was founded and led by Robert Mugabe, and represented the interests of the Shona people. This faction was supported predominantly by the People's Republic of China, and their strategy was on land rather than in the air, planting landmines. But they sustained a lot of the attacks from Rhodesian armed forces on their training camps. You can also see the main world superpowers at work, as Britain and the US sought a smooth transition towards self-governance of Zimbabwe, while the Soviet Union and China sought to destabilise and control this process using both Zanla and Zipra as vehicles to establish their own agendas across the African continent. This dynamic was the underlying narrative that infiltrated much of Africa's decolonisation and was reflected in Macmillan's speech, which indicated Britain's anxieties about the threat of communism. Before I end my podcast, as you know, I always like to leave you with some questions for further thought and discussion. What were some of the challenges in achieving a smooth transition of power from the Rhodesian government to the Zimbabwean people? And how did Britain manage this? What was the cause of the division between the Shona and Nadibli people? And how did Mugabe and Nkomo come together to find a compromise in addressing these divisions after independence was achieved? And finally, what of Robert Mugabe and his time in office as the country's Prime Minister? How has he contributed towards enabling Zimbabwe to make real progress towards self-governance? How will his legacy be defined? Will it be defined as a, a help or a hindrance towards his own country? As I said earlier in this recording, you can find out a little bit more about the context, the wider context of what I talk about in this episode. If you go to my previous episodes, um, The Pink Map Project, the Ultimate Paradox, which talks about Britain's dispute with Portugal over the land in the southern part of Africa, 
during the 1800s where the Europeans were in the process of trying to colonise everything across the continent, and the Wind of Change speech, the expanded edition as well as the standard edition, which talks all about um, Macmillan's Wind of Change speech. So there's there's two or three episodes there that, that you can listen to that will help to provide a wider context to this particular episode. And also don't forget the stories that go with those episodes as well. Nights at the Round Table, the Berlin Conference 1884 and Gone with the Wind, Macmillan's Speech for Change. So I thoroughly recommend those two poetic narratives as well. That That's really going to build your understanding and support what's been in the content, what I've provided in the content of this episode, OK? So feel free, as I always say, to like, follow and share on Facebook and Instagram and don't forget to visit the website to join our mailing list where you'll be updated with promotional offers and future releases as well as those free samples. Once again it's been a pleasure and a privilege to share my learning journey with you and I always always encourage you to either begin or continue your own learning journeys. History is a matter of fact or perspective. Thanks so much for listening again and I'll see you on the next page.